uh, Gregory Deal is the author of a book called Our Global Lingua Franca. Tell me a little bit about why you wrote your book. Our Global Lingua Franca was inspired by a pressing need I saw over the course of many years and many countries worth of experience trying to be an English teacher around the world. What really stood out to me was that there were certain mistakes, certain obvious flaws that seem to persist in every country I've taught in, which is about 12 so far in every continent, except for Antarctica, of course. <laughs> um, and, and it just kind of amazed me that there could be problems so systemic that they seem to literally exist all over the world. Yes. And in fact, since I've written the book, I have shown it to many students and teachers in other countries that I haven't been to or taught in. Uh -huh. And so far, pretty much everyone has said to me, yeah, this is uh, pretty much how we learn English in school here. This, what you've described here, this, <laughs> this really broken backwards counterproductive system where people might take 10 years of mandatory English schooling and still barely be able to put a few sentences together in English. Something yes. isn't working. It should be obvious to anyone capable of thinking Right, so what exactly isn't working? And so I decided I, I was in a position to kind of document and try to explain these mistakes and what we can do. Anyone in any teaching position anywhere in the world, no matter who they're working with, can make simple but obvious adjustments that lead to you know, demonstrably better English fluency results. And I was really drawn to your book and reading your book. I really enjoyed it. My background, before I became a YouTuber, I was in education for 24 years. I had been a teacher um, teaching students who, second, who were second language learners, learning English. And then I went on uh, the last like about 12 years of my career, I led language development for a school district. So I could relate to so many of the things that I read in your book. Um, yeah. What are some of the experiences that led you to write your book? Um, it was a lot of frustration because I kept seeing really intelligent, passionate, motivated people trying really hard to do well in school according to the metrics that they give for how you're supposed to learn English, get good grades on homework and tests, get into a good university. My school says my English is C1 now. That must mean I'm pretty good at English, right? Well, maybe, but let me actually try to have a conversation with you and see how well you can actually yeah. use the language, especially with something you haven't been prepared to say. You know, that's what really throws people off. It seems like there are certain common universal conversations that everyone memorizes how to have in English, which is better than nothing, I guess. It, it gives at least like a, a base level understanding of how the language can be used. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, and you? How many brothers and sisters do you have, right? But if you try to even ask those same types of questions, but phrasing them in a slightly unconventional way, it immediately throws them off because they haven't memorized how to respond to those types of questions. It's really shocking and obvious when you see it. They're like robots um, and not even like the impressive artificially intelligent robots we now have that could adjust to such things like this. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that these failings on the um, language development, it, it's not unique to English. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like here in the United States, you know, when we're teaching foreign languages to um, English only students, you know, monolingual English only students, I feel that so much of this relates to that as well. I, I remember once, um, you know, I had taken Spanish and French in high school, and then early on I went to uh, France on vacation um, back when Euro Disneyland was first opening in 92. And I remember going off on my own and I was thinking, well, you know, I can speak French, you know, I can get my needs met. I can, you know, have basic conversations. And I was in a, a bus and I was trying to talk to the bus driver and it was so darn hard. <laughs> and it just made me realize it's like, oh, I don't speak French. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those years all, all my schooling has not prepared me for the simplest real world interactions. Absolutely not. Uh, so I've worked hard to correct that um as well as tried to help teachers and educators correct that as well <laughs> yeah i had the similar experience with spanish i took spanish in high school for two years didn't learn a damn thing except the most uh -huh. basic vocabulary um then i went to live in costa rica after graduating high school and within nine months i was what i would call conversationally fluent just by talking to costa ricans in spanish 
that's all that's, it took, right? A, a yeah. Years and years of schooling wouldn't have given me that basic competency to actually be able to communicate in the language. I'm, I'm experiencing the same thing here. I live in Armenia now, in Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. I've been here four years. I, and I can't get the local populace to speak Armenian with me for some reason. They're terrified to. They prefer to speak exclusively <laughs> English almost all the time. And I've tried to hire like five different Armenian teachers. They won't speak Armenian with me when teaching me. They give me lists of <laughs> Armenian words to memorize, and then they explain everything in English. And I say to them, why won't you speak Armenian with me? I need to hear the language more. I need to see how to actually use it in a functional way. And they don't have an answer. They kind of get freeze up like deer in the headlights, like there's some kind of weird psychological block they have against it that I don't really understand. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, until you really experienced immersion yourself, trying to learn a language, it, it's hard to really value that. Um, you know, I had a, a French teacher in high school, not, not in high school, excuse me. You know, my high school was very much what you described um as the problem um when i went to college i took a french class and i had a very inspired teacher and the first like 15 minutes she spoke to us in english and then she said well does anybody have any questions and we're like no and she said okay these are the last words of english i'll ever i'll ever say to you and of course you know we all slumped down in our, our seats scared to death but she would do backflips to try to make us understand Mm -hmm. um she would act like a clown she would draw p things pantomime things not only was it incredibly um enriching to have all this input all this comprehensible input in french it also um made us believe that we we can speak the language because we were understanding her so it 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 was a very valuable experience that really shaped my thinking for future years in, in language development. Yeah, and I don't have a problem with using a little bit of the native language. I think you should, of yes. course, speak at the level your students are able to understand or maybe just slightly beyond that. So if there's just one particular obscure word they, they can't understand through context, okay, maybe translate it for them, but, but don't make them rely on the native language translation. Just say, this is like this word in your native language. Or if there's some grammatical concept that no matter how many times you try to explain it, they're just not getting it, then okay, explain it in the native language to the extent that they need it, but then go back into English, right? As much as possible, expose them to English, get them to try to understand the things they've never tried to understand in English and communicate with you in English, right? Minimize the native language. I 100% agree with that, that you, using the native language is a tool and it's you know one of many tools that you have to teach and um and sometimes people can be in really black and white thinking and it's like no no no, this doesn't have to be black and white at all you know you try your best to stay in the language but check for understanding and when they don't understand that's one of the tools that you can use to get them to understand and like you mm -hmm. said right back into the target language um absolutely or the same thing even with like correcting mistakes when students make them. I don't know why English teachers are so shy about telling a student when they're saying something wrong. It's like they don't yeah. want to be rude or off-putting. They don't want to discourage or maybe they don't want to be culturally insensitive. Like I've heard people say, well, that's just how Armenians speak English. It's like their cultural way of speaking English. No, it's they learned it wrong in school. That's why they're speaking it that way. Right. If you correct them and tell them that's not how we conjugate that kind of sentence, that's not how we use that expression, use it like this if you want to be understood by English speakers. They'll say, thank you. Why are you the first person to tell me this? I don't know why. I don't know why you aren't free as a teacher, why you haven't built some kind of rapport with your students so that you say, hey, when I interrupt you and, and correct you, when I say you've made a mistake, don't take it as a personal insult. I'm just trying to help you understand the language better. And the, the sooner I correct your bad habits, the easier it will be for you to, to integrate the correct way to say them, right? And so unless your students are like terrified of you and, and terribly self-conscious, this shouldn't have some kind of traumatizing effect on them. Like, oh no, I made a mistake in front of the teacher. How dare I? Yeah, that's actually a, a systematic problem in the American education system we were taught early on to not correct 
um, students' mistakes in the target language, but rather to kind of like parrot back the correct way of saying mm -hmm. in the hopes that they would catch on that you're saying it differently than the way they said yeah, it. They don't do that. It I've, I've had students I've worked with for months and they don't realize that I am saying something very basic, very common differently than they are saying it until I point it out to them. Have you noticed, you know, <laughs> like for example, here in Armenia, for some reason they learn the expression, thanks God as thank, no, uh, thank God they learn as thanks God. So now I've got it okay. because I've been listening to them. The expression is thank God, like you're giving a command or a suggestion to thank God for something amazing, miraculous that has happened to you. They say, thanks God like you are addressing God, saying, hey, God, thanks uh -huh. for that. Let me know if I can ever <laughs> return the favor, right? It totally changes the mood and the emotions associated with it. They don't hear the difference. They will right. not notice after months of speaking to me that I am saying, thank God, without the S, because they're not listening for it. They think they already know how to say that expression. So I have to tell them, I know it seems like such a minor difference, but you will sound funny to Americans and other native English speakers if you say, thanks, God, in front of them. So. If you want to be well received and understood, just say thank God. That's the correct way to use that expression. It's the way 100% of native English speakers use it. And if you're not explicit about it, then some students will never catch on that that's uh, that mm -hmm. that's a better way of doing doing it. Uh, you know, and that's a change that we've been trying to make um, in the past, like 15 years or so, in American education is realizing that that doesn't work. Uh, it, it doesn't work what I was saying earlier about just parroting back yeah. the correct and you, way. And you have to explain why the correction matters. You can't just say, well, trust right. me, we do it this way. You have to say, here's, people will interpret you differently if you say it like that. Like, yeah. even though thanks God is a grammatically valid thing you could say, you could talk to God and thank him. But if you use the expression that way, people will interpret what you're saying differently. And that's the problem. So you have to explain right. to them why why it matters to say it correctly. Or even in basic pronunciation things, they seem totally ignorant of sometimes. I've had some students from Spain who, when they would say certain words starting with S, these were competent English speakers, you know, at least conversationally fluent, but certain words starting with S, they would add the E sound in front of it. Yes. Like I, yesterday I went to a school uh -huh. and I'd ask, do you realize you're doing that? They had no idea. Because in Spanish, many words start with the ES letter combination. Escuela is school in Spanish, right? Or even right. The word Spanish is Espanol, right? So I think they were just so unconsciously starting S words with the E vowel sound that they started slipping it into English. And they had no idea they were doing it until I pointed it out to them and kind of mocked them, parried them, saying, look, when I say it, it sounds like I went to school. When you say it, it sounds like I went to a school. Do you hear uh -huh. it now when I show you the comparison? So again, it might seem like a little mean-spirited to like be mocking them, but they see that I'm clearly doing it with the intent of helping them, just showing them in, in a little bit overly dramatized way. This is what it sounds like when you say that. Right. It's very easy for anybody who's trying to speak a second language to fall back on the phonological rules of their native language, mm -hmm. and they don't always apply. And that's a perfect example that you gave that, you know, a phonological rule of Spanish that is a different phonological rule in English. And whether you're ever explicitly taught that or not, it needs to be pointed out, even if it's just through examples. Yeah, I wish yeah. people would do that with me in Armenian because there are several like throaty sounds here that I haven't quite mastered that sound almost identical to me. And people sometimes chuckle when I try to say certain words in Armenian. And I say, please tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> Show me yeah. how I should be pronouncing it differently. Like, you won't offend me, please. <laughs> but they they are uncomfortable with that for some reason. Yeah, I think that that's a cultural thing in a lot of places. Absolutely. Okay, so what advantages does English have over other languages as the lingua franca? I dedicate a whole chapter to that in the book. It's the first chapter in the book, Why English? And I think it's probably the most important chapter because all my arguments rest upon it, that there's a reason why English is the objectively most useful language to learn. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best language for you personally to learn. There could be many other languages that you have very good reasons for wanting to learn more than English. So I'm not at right. all trying to say like object, English is objectively superior and all people should be forced to learn it. I'm saying for practical purposes, there is no other language in the world that comes close to filling the role that English currently does and will undoubtedly continue to fill for a long time in the future. 
So if your goal is to increase your ability to do practical things and communicate with other people around the world for professional or personal reasons, all other things being equal, English is hands down the best option. Uh, even if you just look in terms of like how much English is, uh, how much information is published in English or how much information is translated from other languages into English. I give the example of like Wikipedia in the book. Have you ever tried to use a non-English version of Wikipedia? It's not nearly as complete, robust, dynamic. Uh, look up almost anything you want in a lesser used world language. I use an example of the Armenian language in the book that uh, there's 1 20th, 5% the amount of articles. Virtually all those articles are not nearly as long or complete. So if you're just looking at this from the perspective of you're an Armenian who only speaks Armenian and you want to educate yourself about a whole universe of scientific and historical and philosophical knowledge that should be available free to you on a website like Wikipedia, you have 5% or less of the options available that an English speaker would. So already you're at a huge disadvantage just because you happened to be born in a part of the world that doesn't teaches you, teach you a major world language or the world's most popular world language where the most information is available. For that reason alone, you can read more books, you can watch more movies, you can listen to more audio recordings and various other things that will teach you or entertain you in the ways you want to be taught or entertained. Even if you never go visit America, is that alone not a pretty compelling reason to learn English? I know many people here who are very glad that they learned English, who prefer to speak in English, who have never been outside the country. And they talk to foreigners like me when we come here in English, but most of the time they use Armenian in their practical lives because everyone around them speaks Armenian, but when they want to study something, when they, when they want to be exposed to ideas from outside their culture, there's no way they could do those things in Armenian or even in Russian, which is also commonly spoken here, which is certainly a more prominent world language than Armenian, but nowhere near to the extent that English is. And when you travel the world, you really see how prominent English is in surprising places. Mm -hmm. uh, I traveled to South Korea and I was shocked at how much of the signage was in English. Um, yeah, I just I just came back from Morocco and um, obviously, you know, Arabic is the number one language there, the Moroccan di dialect of Arabic. And there is definitely uh, more French than English, but there were many signs in English as well. So um, and those are just two examples. But I've been all sorts of different places in the world where, you know, far from any native English speaker and. English is present. It just yeah. is. I spent more than 10 years, traveled to more than 50 countries. And though, I, like I said, I do speak pretty good Spanish now, and I do attempt to learn various local languages. If I'm in one place for a long time, I, I speak at least basic Armenian now, although I should be much better at Armenian. Um, I, I've been to 50 countries and almost all the time was able to function exclusively in English because yeah, there are signs posted in English. Uh, anyone who works at any kind of major business will probably speak English because they wanna be able to cater to international customers. Even in remote towns and villages in countries that are not known for being very well educated or developed, there's always someone nearby who speaks English. So even if you go into a little shop and, and nobody can understand you, they say, oh, let, let me go ask my neighbor, Frank, if he can translate for us, you can buy this thing for me. Like it's, it's just always there. I compare it to currencies in the book. You can travel the world with dollars and euros, but not with Armenian drum, right? Yes. Because even if the local shops don't accept dollars and euros, they can convert it. They can exchange it into right. other languages, other currencies, sorry, very easily. Even if there's a little bit of a delay or a conver conversion cost, maybe we could say, uh, you can still function with major world currencies like the dollar and the euro. You can't with tiny minor currencies. I thought that was a really good comparison. Um, and you know, other languages, certainly there are other languages in specific parts of the country that might be geographically more important when you look at the world as a whole, there's no argument that English is the number one unifying language. Uh, I just came back from Morocco and I took a tour of Morocco and the tour guide um, was, you know, a Moroccan born and raised, lives in Marrakesh. And when he was 19 years old, he moved to Germany. And of course, you know, being a Moroccan, um, in addition to Arabic and the Moroccan dialect of Arabic, he 
he was raised speaking French, you know, through the public, through, through the school system. And so when he, he told me that when he went to Germany, he really, he tried to speak to people in French because he didn't speak any German. And, you know, of course he knows it's Germany. He knows that's not the number one language, but he really thought that that would be a second language for people. And he said, nobody spoke French there, but they spoke English. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, since then he's learned, learned English. And I just think that that's a, a very typical example of somebody who finding out the power or the importance of English globally. Yeah, so that's why I try to make the argument throughout the book that if you want to help people around the world, what single skill could you give them? What single subject could they study that would open up the most opportunities for them for the smallest investment of time and effort? And I can't think of anything better than speaking English, except like basic math, obviously. Everybody needs right. to be able to add two and two. But hey, with calculators on our phones these days, maybe even that is a bit overrated. Maybe you can get by <laughs> not knowing very much math, right? Uh, but right. the ability to communicate in English, like I just can't think of anything else that compares. Once you can communicate with the rest of the world, you're not limited to just what happens to be available locally to you. You can extend beyond your cultural and political and economic limitations to participate with the rest of the world at any level you want. I, I find it fascinating how many situations where you have a non-native speaker of English um, who speaks with a native speaker of a different language. You know, like for instance, uh, you know, if, a, if an Italian uh, pilot is landing in China, mm -hmm. you know, and, and his native, speak, native language is Italian and the air traffic controllers first language is Chinese. Well, what are they going to speak to each other in? English. English is now the official language of air travel around the world. They, yeah. they, because obviously for practical reasons, it might be really dangerous and difficult and confusing to try to be coordinating planes landing when every pilot coming from every different country speaks a different language. One of my students right now, incidentally, is a guy who's trying to get his pilot license. Like, I, I don't know exactly what type of license, but there's there is a test he has to take. I think it's abbreviated ICAO. Let me look up what that stands for. Test. The International Civil Aviation Organization test. Yes. He has to score a six out of six, which I looked up what that means. And it means he basically has to be fluent in English. He's conversationally fluent right now. He scored a five the last time he took the test, which basically means he can speak and understand 80% of everything he needs to, right? And when I talk to him, he sounds competent. He has a foreign accent. He struggles with some words, but he's intelligent and can speak English. That was enough to get him a five out of six, but not pass the test. He has to get a perfect six if he wants to fly internationally. Like that, this is a real student I'm working with currently. So he came to me saying, Can you take me from being very good at English to being perfect enough to be qualified to fly internationally. Interesting. And, you know, I, uh, interesting thing with like pilots and air traffic controllers, too, is um, there's a danger with native English speakers because, you know, of course, they speak the language. Of course, you know, English is their first language, but they have to be careful about how they speak English. Colloquial use slang. He mentioned right. that. He actually said that to me. He said that he's confused sometimes when other pilots, Americans, will be will be using slang he doesn't understand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's talk about education. How can educators improve improve their attempts to teach English as a foreign language? Okay. Um, there's a huge difference between the way we assess English currently and the way we use English, right? That's that's the core of the issue. And so we have to somehow find ways to take the way we instruct English and make it closer to the way people use English. But in particular, it should be things that the student is really interested in learning, practical reasons they have to use English that way, which are infinite and quite varied, right? Is right. your student interested in playing sports? What kind of English would he use while playing a football game? Is your student interested in reading romance novels? What kind of language is he going to come up with, uh, come across in romance novels? Video games, animals, farming, fishing, air travel, right? right? So the more specific reason somebody has to be learning English, the easier it is to find ways to 
tailor the education to their needs, right? Which means you need to be very flexible. And even if they don't have some specific reason, like there's some test they have to pass, right? Um, whatever it is that the student is interested in, those are the things that can be talked about in English because those are the things they're going to have reasons to want to communicate about with you, especially with children, where enthusiasm is such a big part of maintaining their interest. Adults are a lot better at forcing themselves to do things they don't necessarily actually want to do. Like they know right. they have to do this because it'll help them get a better job. So they're, they will themselves into it. But a child, it's much harder to do that with and frankly, not very productive, even if you can get them to do it. So how do you keep them enthused? Talk about things they actually want to talk about which is yes. different for every child. That's so different than the authoritarian approach we usually take, especially with children, where we just try to get them to say, do it this way because I'm your teacher and I commanded you to, and this is what the book says you're supposed to be learning. I'm your mother, go to your room, you're grounded if you don't learn it this way, right? Instead of just you know treating the child with the smallest amount of respect and saying, well, what do you wanna learn? What's interesting for you to talk about? Is there any reason they have to be learning English on a very specific timetable? following a very specific curriculum where you have to know these phrasal verbs by age seven or you're failing. Why? <laughs> Who invented that standard? Like as long right. as they're still organically increasing their ability to use language in ways they care about and that they will remember, that's all that matters to me. I uh, really, through my efforts to learn um, Spanish and French and some other languages as well, uh, what I've really grown to understand is that Becoming fluent in a language is really like a lifelong process. Not that you don't ever cross that line at a certain point where you can call yourself fluent. That's definitely you know possible. Um, but you're going to be learning the language for the rest of your life. When you talked about like all those different to topics, all those different domains, like you know, I, I can, I'm I'm fairly fluent in Spanish. I can talk about anything that interests me in Spanish. Um, but could I talk about, could I go to the dentist and talk about cavities? You know, I'd mm -hmm. probably get lost. Yeah, I right? probably like, I want to bring Google anyway. Translate with you to look up the translation of words as you needed them, right? Exactly, there's always going to be some domain, domains where I don't have sufficient vocabulary. And that's just, mm -hmm. of course, that's going to be less and less as I go through my life, as I get better and better in Spanish, but it's never going to go away. You know, that's because think about it, even with our native language, you know, in mm -hmm. my native native language is English as well. And I'm still learning new words. Yeah, that's something I have to think about as a writer, because I have to think, what should I already expect my audience to be familiar with? If I'm writing a book about linguistics and how to teach English, I'm going to assume, you know, words related to basic linguistics, like that right. you know what a phrasal verb is, you know what it means to conjugate a verb, you know what it means, to, you know, uh, so I'm not going to hold your hand and define all these things for you, except in, unless I think like maybe a native, a non-native English speaker might be reading this and not be familiar with that term. And then maybe in a footnote or something, I'll elaborate on exactly what I mean by that or in the specific context I'm using it. Right. Right. Um, but, the, but anything, right. If, if I start reading a chemistry book, if I haven't studied chemistry before, I'm going to have to learn some new words about the dynamics of chemistry, right? And that's fine. It might be overwhelming for me at first if I learn 10 new words on the first page of a book, right? Uh, and that's exactly the same way we learn foreign languages too. Anytime the, the English learner is exposed to new words, it has to be in a context that is meaningful for them so that it will be easy for them to remember and then immediately start to use in their own vocabulary too. It's like that advice that if you are constantly forgetting people's names when you meet them the first time. You're supposed to use their name like five times immediately after learning it. Right. Hi, I'm Gregory. Nice to meet you, Gregory. Where are you from, Gregory? What's your favorite type of music, Gregory? How many brothers and sisters do you have, Gregory? <laughs> right, then supposedly right. you will remember my name, right? Well, the same thing is true if you learn a new word or a new phrase. Um, even one of my teaching assistants, I usually work with a non-native teaching assistant so, you know, they, they're fluent in English, practically speaking, but there still might be some particular phrases they've never heard before or they could be confused by. And as we were starting one class, I said to her, all right, let's get going, uh, take it away. She said, what, what do you want me to take away? <laughs> like you want me to remove something physically? Uh -huh. I said, no, you've never heard that expression before. It's fairly common, take it away, like get going, get started, you know, yeah. do the thing. <laughs> and she'd never heard that before, even though she was a very accomplished English speaker. And so yeah. I had to explain that that's, that's just a, a phrase we use, right? Um, and, and so immediately after, like she's, the reason she's so good at English is she understands these things. And so she immediately forced herself to say it 
a few times throughout the lesson because she knew that would help her remember it, right? That's that's the only way you organically increase your vocabulary, not sitting and memorizing lists of vocabulary words so that you can get a good grade on a test when it asks you to fill in a certain bubble. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and I, I'm always really surprised whenever I learn a new word, uh, whether it's in my native language of English or whether it's in Spanish or French or whatever language that I'm, I'm um, spending time in, I'm amazed at how quickly I find that word again. That, you know, like I may have to look it up. Maybe I'm reading a book in Spanish and I have to look up this word and I found out what it is. Invariably, the very next day or the day after, I'm listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video and they're using that word. And no matter how obscure it is, it's 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 uncanny. And um, even in, in English, and it makes me think, like, how did I go my whole life not paying attention to this word? Yeah. There are certain words that as soon as I learn them, I say, that is such a useful concept. And I immediately start using it. And it's, yeah, it's like I've used it my whole life. And I, I don't know why I never needed that word before. So let's talk about the different types of uh, teachers of English as a foreign language. You know, there are teachers that are native speakers of English, um, like the two of us. And mm -hmm. then there's teachers that are, you know, that more likely they're locals and they're non-natives. Um, teachers of English as a foreign language. And, you know, uh, of course, they might be quite proficient in English. What are the strengths of each type of teacher? So, um, as it currently stands in most countries around the world, the overwhelming majority of English teachers are non-native, right? Yes, I mean, unless, that's an excellent unless, point. Yeah, unless they're lucky enough to import an American or a British person or Australian or something. Uh, which really only the more affluent places can do because generally uh, foreigners are going to demand very competitive salaries if they want to come and teach in a right. foreign country, right? And that's what I did for a few years that I was teaching. You know, I went to places like China where there's so much demand that you can just walk down the street in any city basically and say, hey, are you hiring any American English teachers? And yeah, you'll, you'll immediately get offers, right? Um, but in most places, that simply isn't going to be the case. And unfortunately, that is what leads to a lot of the very common mistakes that people learn in different countries that they don't even realize are mistakes because well this is how we learned it in school this is how everyone around me says it well because you all learned it wrong right yeah um so I'm, i don't at all mean to imply that non-native english speakers can't be great teachers they absolutely right. can they just have to be aware that there might be certain things they have to pay attention to more because they're not going to have the benefits of having grown up immersed in the actual way that people use the language you right. probably learned it primarily from a textbook that taught in a very artificial and forced way and frankly wrong way in a lot of places the best english speakers in any country in the world are always the people who just watched a lot of american movies or tv shows growing up right because that's how you actually get exposed to the way people really use the language right. and in fact most of them will say that they they had to ignore what they were learning in school in their textbooks because they saw when they were watching friends or something that ross <laughs> and chandler and joey don't speak english that way so they trusted right. the tv show more than what they were learning in their textbook quite wisely so you know because these things are made to be digested consumed by masses of native english speakers so they're going right. to be presented in a way that all english speakers will at least understand even if they themselves don't personally talk like joey tribbiani right yeah <laughs> but they will at least understand how Joey talks, or or maybe people from New York talk in a certain way, but it will still be understandable to Californians or Texans or people right. from England or whatever, right? And so I usually think the best approach, if possible, is to combine a native speaker with a non-native teacher, like I mentioned with, with my non-native teaching assistant, because that way you can actually kind of get the best of both worlds. The native speaker should be more proficient in all the little nuances of how people actually use English and can correct all those little mistakes that non-natives might not realize they're making or introduce new phrases to them, like take it away that maybe they've just never heard before because no one in their country has said it. But the non-native English teacher will almost always understand better things from the perspective of the students. Right. What was difficult about learning English coming from whatever their native language is, because different languages will face different difficulties in grammar or pronunciation, uh, politically and socially, what it's like being in the country, what they're going through in school, what their schedule is like, how much homework they have, and so what kinds of things they'll be capable of taking on when learning English, 
would fit into their lifestyle currently, what kinds of things their friends are likely to be talking about that they could talk about in English. Um, I feel pretty good about doing that here in Armenia now because I've lived here enough years to know what the general Armenian mentality is like, what their general shortcomings are in learning English. So I do a pretty good job here, but still in general, whenever possible, especially if I have more than like 10 students at a time, I try to teach in small groups or privately whenever possible. But if the group gets larger and larger, even just having more than one teacher there to help manage the class, make sure everyone's paying attention, make sure everyone gets an opportunity to speak and participate. That is so much easier to do when you have one other person there to help you, especially with children or people still at the beginning stages of English. I don't even like to teach beginning English students because mm -hmm. it too much of it relies on having to explain things in terms of their native language first. And that's, yeah. I can do that to some extent. Like I know the translation of many basic words or some of the grammatical quirks of Armenian, but I can't do it nearly as well as a native Armenian speaker who learned English, right? You have a whole section in, in your book about that dual teaching, you know, have, pairing up a native speaker with a non-native speaker. That really resonated with me quite a bit, having come from education and also having been in a situation where, you know, I was teaching Spanish where I'm not a native Spanish speaker um, and having teachers that I would work with that were native Spanish speakers. And it really, that experience really highlighted to me some of the strengths that you talked about, um, as well as just the having gone through the process of learning Spanish as a second language, there were times where I, I knew why we did something in Spanish, where a native speaker doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. know why we do it. They just, they can, but they can, re of course, they can rely on whether something sounds right or not. But where I can't really do that as a non-native speaker of Spanish, you know, uh, you know, I don't have the years and years and years of being immersed in the language to be able to say, oh, that just sounds wrong. Yeah. Um, but being able to explain it because I had to learn it and going through the, um, the process of comparing and contrasting it with my native language, sometimes native speakers are clueless about why we say something the way we say it. They can yeah. tell you how to and what to say, but when the student asks why, sometimes they're at a loss. I always love a challenge like that as an English speaker. And maybe it's because I have so much experience with writing and editing too. So I, maybe I think about the language differently. But when a student asks me a question about English, I don't know how to answer. I take it as a challenge. I want to understand, wait, why do we say it that way? What is yeah. the difference between these two words? Why is one better in this situation than another? And if I can't think of the answer on my own, then I have to research it and tell them, you know? So that forces me to get better at the language. Which is the whole notion of a teacher being a lifelong learner mm -hmm. that, that you model through that, that. That's really important as well. And then also, I think that um, uh, teachers that teach a language that's not their native language, um, just a virtue, oh, excuse me, like for instance, uh, when I was teaching Spanish, just the virtue of the fact that I've taught, uh, excuse me, I've learned a second language that immediately puts you in a position, better position to be able to understand how your native language works. Because I don't, you don't really learn what language is until you learn a second language. Yeah, that's part of what's made me appreciate so much about English. Although in many ways it, it is kind of complex and difficult, like our spelling and pronunciation is very right. inconsistent. But also in many other ways, when I try to learn Armenian, for instance, which in many ways its grammar is the syntax just seems so arbitrary to me. Like, like uh -huh. they just arrange the words in a random order. Sometimes it seems that they have a lot of suffixes they have to add to words. It makes me appreciate like how basic the morphology of English is, that we don't have to memorize tons of different suffixes to put on every verb or every noun, every time we change a little thing about it, that it's right. mostly just the order of the words, the syntax that communicates these things, that I can complete create a completely new sentence just by slightly changing the order of the words or inserting another word where there wasn't one before. And I think that's part of what makes English so flexible and so useful as a universal language, that you, you can communicate so much nuance and detail just by changing little things about how you communicate in English, or you can change the sentence you're trying to say in the middle of saying it, in the middle of phrasing it. You can, you can right. take the sentence in a whole totally different direction. 
the next question is let's um, we've talked about the educator side of it now let's talk about the student side of it if you're somebody who's trying to learn english as a foreign language what do you recommend for that person <sighs> Uh, the same, essentially the same thing that I recommend to teachers trying to teach. Find yeah. something you're interested in, either something you have a pressing need to communicate for some practical reason, or just something you're passionate about, because that's going to be much easier for you to overcome those initial hurdles of getting exposed to the vocabulary associated with that thing, or um, when you try to find other people to speak about this thing. That's that's an important part of it. You want to actually use the language as much as possible. Yeah, you can learn a lot by reading a book about something or watching a show about something um but as much as possible and as soon as possible you want to actually start putting these things into practice which means you need to find people to speak english with yes and unless there happen to be tons of english speakers around you because maybe you live in a really international city um that's going to be a lot easier to do with people who share a particular interest and want to talk about a specific thing so you're not just sitting around idly saying this small talk crap that everybody learns yeah. hello how are you i'm fine thank you and you but you want to ask questions about the sport you're really interested in or uh what really surprised me about this is that sometimes i'll play these like online multiplayer games like you know fortnite or or uh, overwatch or valorant these games where just strangers from all over the world will jump into the same server together and they're either on a team or they're playing against each other, but there's a lot of organic communication that has to happen in the game. Like you uh -huh. have to plan, let's let's go around left and try to flank their sniper or whatever, right? And these are words that people have to learn how to use, even in locations where you would not expect English to be the norm, right? Like uh -huh. even on a Russian server, sometimes they'll be speaking Russian, but sometimes it's people who aren't from Russia, right? They're just near the Russian server geographically. And so uh -huh. they're speaking English because they expect that everyone will understand English instead of Russian, right? Uh -huh. And so they've learned all the terminology necessary to the game to give practical commands that people have to immediately understand and follow and implement or the game doesn't work. That's a great example of something where you actually have a practical reason to use the language to communicate something and you see immediately whether or not you've communicated it correctly because people will either understand you or they won't. The game will work or it won't. You know, um, finding content in the target language that's of interest of you, to you, uh, I think that's enormously important, and that's something that I've been trying to do recently with French and Spanish, and and um, I think another benefit to that is on top of the fact that you know it's it's something that interests you, it holds your attention. You also bring more prior knowledge to to the situation because it's since it's a topic that you are interested in while you may or may not know the language that goes with it you do have prior knowledge of the concepts which makes trying to make sense of the language easier because you bring that prior knowledge to it mm -hmm. you know i can certainly uh you know understand text written in french about tennis because that's a sport that i'm passionate about you know i play tennis every day um then if i were to read something about rugby which I don't, I know nothing about. You yeah. Know. And there's always increasingly finer levels of detail to go into. Once you know the basic terminology related to cooking or ordering food at a restaurant, you know, how much more detailed can you get? Can you learn every technique for how to cook a steak? Can you learn yeah. the name of every spice that you might use in a recipe? Yeah, the vocabulary is endless. It's like, you know, you, you learned the basics, but then you have to go deep in all these areas. And yeah. that going deep, you know, that that can take a lifetime. Although you although of course, you know, you get better and better and better at it. So your book. Where can somebody find your book? And where where can they connect with you? The book is on all major online retailers like Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So uh, check that out. It's available in ebook, audiobook, and paperback and hardcover. So whatever format you prefer. I am on Facebook a lot, so you can look me up there if you want, or just check out my website, which is my name, gregorydeal.net. Deal is spelled D-I-E-H-L. And let me know what you think. If you have read the book, reach out to me. I always like to hear whether people loved or hated it or have questions about it. I'll put the links to some, some of the things you talked about in the description, so make sure, sure. to look down in the, in the description uh, for that.
Well, Gregory, thank you so much. This is I, I really enjoyed reading your book. Um, and it's awesome to talk to the author about it. And I think that it's extremely useful, um, especially coming from the world that I came from, you know, education and teaching students English. Um, and even though I'm in the United States, um, it's not teaching English as a foreign language. The concept still applied, absolutely still applied for, you know, the educators here in the United States. Um, but I also think that there's something very universal about it in that you you could replace this with any other language and these concepts still apply as well. So I think it's a very useful book and I highly encourage people to seek it out and read it. Yeah, well, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I just hope that it actually starts to make some kind of practical effect on the way people who are have the freedom to change the way they teach actually implement these principles yes oh one last story and then and then we'll we'll wrap this up uh one of the things i was reading in um in your book you were talking about some practical applications and one thing is you know to have it very conversation driven one of the best times i was ever in a foreign language class it was an it was a, a french class and I remember you, and in your book, you talked about asking open-ended questions. That was one of the things that you mentioned. Yeah. Well, they had asked, the, the French teacher asked the open-ended question, if there was a pill that you could t take that would make you live forever, would you take that pill? And then all the students talked about it. And it was so completely engaging. Um, it was surprising to hear people's answers. Uh, this conversation, which lasted a good hour, um, was so engaging that we honestly kind of forgot that we were speaking in the second language. Yeah, and you even forget that the purpose is that you're learning English, right, or whatever right. the language is, because you're so focused on the thing you're talking about or teaching practical skills. I give the example of teaching guitar lessons because that's something I've done in English. The student yeah. primarily wanted to learn how to play the guitar, but I kind of tricked them into also learning English by teaching them how to <laughs> play the guitar in English, right? So they're focused on the guitar part and they're kind of also accidentally learning English at the same time. So you're having a philosophical discussion about whatever thing people are stimulated by, they think that's what they're learning, but what they're actually learning is how to use English in new ways. <laughs> you're making me laugh because I, I'm working out at the gym with a trainer right now and we only speak in spanish <laughs> and it's just simply for the fact that this is a native spanish speaker even though he's very very competent in, in english but i'm like why not take advantage of the fact that you know that gets me an extra hour of, yeah, of sure. communicating in the target language and of course you know obviously we talk about fitness but we talk about anything and everything under the sun and it's just such a great uh opportunity so that's the kind of thing that English learners need to do too. Look for every opportunity you have to actually use English, even if it's not something obvious. If your trainer yeah. is an English speaker in whatever country you live in, speak English with him. Why not? Right. All those little opportunities really add up. Well, thank you so much, Gregory. This was really a pleasure.